So in Unit 2.2, we've already discussed two types of transport, passive and active transport. We've talked about how passive doesn't need energy, and active transport does need energy. Today we're going to start our notes on page 32, and our focus is going to be on that energy molecule. One thing that we want to keep in mind is that cells will also have to maintain that energy. They will have to make it, and then they'll have to use it. They're not going to make more than they need. They might store a little extra energy in anticipation that it's going to be used. But they're always going to try to be as efficient as possible. So maintaining homeostasis requires energy. And just think back. Where did we talk about energy before? Which Sternberg process, life function, did we talk about that requires energy? And hopefully you'll remember that that was respiration. Respiration was where we created energy, okay? That's our Sternberg process that we're focusing on today. So cells use energy in the form of ATP. ATP is that little yellow sheet that you guys have been getting, okay? You remember these? Here's a picture of a little mitochondria, so that's a little hint for you. And it's actually, it actually stands for adenosine triphosphate. So in the picture on the right-hand side, you do want to go ahead and draw a box around this molecule. This is ATP. And you'll need to be able to identify this. Now, with this structure, this should look kind of similar to you. This might look like another monomer that we've talked about before. And in that monomer... Ninth graders with last names beginning O through SH. Please report to the media center. In that <coughs> monomer, we only... We have... You see sometimes it looks like a square or a rectangle. A nitrogen base. We had a deoxyribose sugar or a ribose sugar. And we only had one little P circle here. One phosphate group. Okay? This is actually the very same structure or similar structure to our monomer nucleotides that form clay acids. So this is very similar to what forms DNA or RNA. But ATP itself will actually hold small amounts of energy between those three phosphates. So between these bonds right here, bonds have energy. And when you break these bonds, when you pull off that last phosphate group, that'll actually release energy so your cells can function, so your cells can use it. So when your cells are using energy, like in your muscle cells, these ATP molecules, the whole thing, will be ready at your muscle cell. And when your muscle cell needs to contract to move your arms and legs, then one of these will be pulled off. When it breaks off, that bond that was between it releases energy for you to function. Now, in right here, we actually see a reaction. In this reaction, we see that, okay, we have our ATP molecule right there, and now we're going to use it. When we use it, we break off that last phosphate group, phosphate group, triphosphate, three phosphates, and now we have one phosphate kind of hanging around, and now we have ADP. ADP, adenosine diphosphate, DI, remember stands for two. And so now you have two phosphate groups and a free phosphate. Now later on you can actually reuse these two molecules, put them back together to make the adenosine triphosphate again. So it actually gets recycled. Again, one of, a, one of our Sternberg functions, okay? And so we might even want to write that in there. That this is through one of our Sternberg. Now, in cellular respiration, our cells will break down food or carbohydrates to transfer energy into the bonds of ATP, energy, okay? So, if you, while you're reading this, this should all sound very familiar to the function of our mitochondria. Remember
remember that respiration is actually going to occur within the mitochondria of our cells. So in eukaryotic cells, a series of reactions occur in that mitochondria. Now the reaction that occurs is in this equation right here for you guys. This is the cellular respiration equation. You will have to remember this equation, so it's very important that you understand what it's saying. Here you have glucose, which is a carbohydrate, a food that you're going to eat for animals, or a product that you're going to make in photosynthesis for plants. Either way, you have this carb, this food. You'll take in some oxygen. All of this will go into your mitochondria, where the reaction happens, RxN stands for reaction, and you'll actually produce some carbon dioxide, the waste that we breathe out, and plants also breathe out in a way breathe. We'll breathe out some water, there's a little moisture to it, and we'll have energy that our cells will hold on to. So again, glucose plus oxygen will produce or will go through the reaction to make carbon dioxide, water, energy. On the left-hand side, these things are called our reactants. And on the right-hand side, these are our products. In a reaction, you always have both. And the ultimate desire, the end product of this cellular respiration, this process, is to make ATP. Okay? And again, all of this is happening within the folds of our mitochondria. That's where the work is occurring. And that's why it was so important to have a lot of that surface area. So again, there's our equation. All of this is happening in our mitochondria. And when we actually use oxygen, aerobic, use oxygen, then this process actually takes a little longer, but we make more ATP. Really important to know that aerobic respiration makes more ATP. There's actually two types of respiration that can occur, aerobic and anaerobic, with oxygen or without oxygen. So when you use oxygen to go through this process and you have oxygen available for your mitochondria to use, then you're going to be able to make more ATP, but it does take a little longer. You can kind of almost think of this as the normal way to do it. This is playing by the rules, okay? And sometimes when you play by the rules, it might take a little longer, but you're going to get a better result at the end. You're making more ATP, and that's your goal. On the other hand, if you're kind of rushing things and not playing by the rules, and not using oxygen, like it's required in the equation, then you actually go through a process of anaerobic. So an is going to be like no, and aerobic is going to be air, no air, and technically no oxygen. So anaerobic respiration is when your cells are starting to feel very rushed. They need to make a lot of energy and they need to make it quick but they don't have oxygen readily available. Another name for anaerobic respiration is fermentation. And fermentation does not use oxygen. It can be faster, but the downside is that you produce a lot less ATP. In addition to that, there's also some more consequences to not using that oxygen. When you don't use the oxygen, when you don't play by the rules, there's going to be some consequences. And for your cells, for your mitochondria, comes in two forms. The first is that you'll actually end up producing some alcohol. And sometimes that's known as alcoholic fermentation. And that just means respiration that makes alcohol. Now some cells will use this type of respiration, like bacteria, fungus, and yeast, which is another type of fungus. 
It will actually produce the ATP, the energy, the carbon dioxide is still made, but you'll have a little bit of alcohol and water still. Um, one good thing about this is that we've learned that through this process we can make some sorts of cheeses. We can make um, yogurts and soy sauce and wine and beer. Um, even your nail polish and rubbing alcohol is produced through this product, through this process. Now, there is one more type of drawback or one more type of anaerobic respiration. Um, and by the way, we're going to be seeing this soon. We're going to actually see some yeast, that type of fungus, go through anaerobic respiration. But the second type of anaerobic respiration is known as lactic acid fermentation. And lactic acid fermentation is going to be used by some animals. When animals are actually really rushed, they need a lot of energy and they need it quickly, then they'll actually make your carbon dioxide, your H2O, your ATP go through respiration, but they'll also make some lactic acid. And if you're an athlete, then this should sound familiar to you because lactic acid is what makes sore muscles, okay? So if you're like me and don't work out very often and your muscles aren't used to being very strenuous or being overworked or worked to a certain point, then my cells, my muscle cells, aren't used to produ producing a lot of energy to be able to support that. So if I decide to run a marathon today, the next day I'd probably be really, really sore. And I may not have even made, made it to the marathon. But my muscles would be very, very sore because they're not used to taking in that oxygen and converting it, converting those carbohydrates into ATP really, really, really fast. And because it needs it to happen really, really, really fast, then it's going to revert to anaerobic respiration. And for animals, when you do anaerobic respiration, you also produce some lactic acid. This also happens in really big animals, like the cheetah. The cheetah is, one of, is the fastest animal in the world, but to get that spurt of speed, the cheetah can run really, really fast, but it can't run really, really fast for really, really long. So the reason for that is because it does end up producing lactic acid. There is a drawback to this process because you're not playing by the rules. You're not getting oxygen like you usually would in regular aerobic respiration. So in your summary box, if you would actually compare and contrast aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration in one sentence, okay, compare the difference between aerobic and anaerobic respiration, and also write one description of ATP. Really important that you know what ATP is, what it looks like, what the molecule looks like, and how does it get broken down? How does it release energy? So one statement, one sentence about the difference between aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, and one sentence about ATP.